So it's 11 o'clock. Um, I think we'll just get started now. Greetings to everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, What We Know About Nano EHS Measurement and Characterization. My name is Vince Hackley. I'm a research chemist with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. This is a non-regulatory agency within the Department of Commerce, and I'm gonna serve as your moderator for today's webinar. The 2021 Nano EHS webinar series is focused on sharing what we know about the environmental health and safety aspects of engineered nanomaterials. Today's webinar will feature experts from diverse disciplines to share their perspectives on key findings on this topic. Before we introduce our speakers, I want to mention that the Nano EHS webinar series is an important platform for agencies participating in the National Nanotechnology Initiative, or NNI. They use this venue to share information on Nano EHS research progress and findings. So throughout this series, experts will share the big take-home messages and the, with the broader nanotechnology community and highlight the NNI's role in addressing the important questions. We've set aside time for your questions to the panel. You can type your questions in the Q&A box, which hopefully you can see on your screen. We will try to get through as many of these questions as we can, and I look forward to a very lively conversation. So let's get started. A decade ago, the 2011 NNI Environmental Health and Safety Research Strategy document emphasized that nanomaterial measurements underpin all aspects of nano EHS and the responsible development of nanotechnology. Good measurements provide confidence in research results. It's really that simple. Good measurements allow scientists to produce accurate risk assessments and to develop appropriate risk management tools. Good measurements are also key to meeting regulatory needs. For oversight of regulatory regulated products that contain nanomaterials. And without these accurate, reliable measurements, real progress is impossible. However, the technical challenges for the development of a robust nanomaterial measurement infrastructure, as proposed in the 2011 strategy 10 years ago, are many. Over the past decade, advances have been made across multiple areas of nanomaterial metrology or, or measurement science, including the detection and characterization of nanomaterials under realistic exposure conditions and in complex matrices such as soils, wastewater, even biological systems. Some areas have advanced faster than others, and there have been some dramatic advances in the past decade. Uh, one example would be in the area of single particle analysis using ICP mass spec. Uh, this is a method that essentially didn't exist 10 years ago. Today, we'll hear about some of these important advan advances from our expert panel, and we'll learn about continuing and new challenges that lie ahead. Our first panel member is Wendell Volaben. Wendell is a senior principal scientist at BASF, in the departments of materials, physics, and experimental toxicology and ecology. He has previously acted as an innovation manager for BASF growth cluster nanotechnology, and where he was responsible for creating a nano innovation, and I'm sorry, an open innovation roadmap in the European technology platform for sustainable chemistry. He currently supervises laboratories involved in the characterization of colloidal systems, serving as the development of advanced materials and the development of physical methods for their characterization. His lab investigates physical chemical aspects related to the safety of nanomaterials. He also coordinates BASF's collaborative project cluster on the safety of nanomaterials, which has more recently included microplastics. Our second panelist is Joanne Shatkin. Joanne is president and founder of Vireo Advisors, LLC. This is a team of science policy experts that are dedicated to proactive safety demonstration that brings more sustainable products to the economy. She's an environmental health scientist and a recognized expert in environmental aspects of novel and emerging substances. Joanne has served on a nano safety, as a nanosafety expert on the National Academy of Sciences here in the US the Canadian Council of Academics, 
uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization at WHO, the World Health Organization, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. She is a fellow of the Society for Risk Assessment and serves on the board of the Center for Environmental Policy at American University and also the Forest Products Research Institute at the University of Maine. Uh, one more, one final comment before I turn things over to the panel. I, I hope that you will join us for other the other Nano EHS webinars in this series. More information on these webinars can be found, and all NNI public webinars for that matter can be found at nano.gov. You can also follow us on Twitter at NNI Nano News. So let's proceed to our panelists. Wendell, the floor is yours. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Thank you also for having me here at all. Um, it is really a pleasure to reconnect to some um, with whom um, I've been working before. I saw some on the participants list, but really it's um, it will be interesting to chat about what we know about nano EHS. Um, and I wanna just quickly touch on three main issues. And in the end, I'm also going to come back to this beautiful camper car that you see here. Now, the first issue that we have, especially um, in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, we now have increasing pressure as industry to identify, characterize, measure, and report on different so-called nano forms of a substance, which means that we need to provide data on size distribution, shape, crystallinity, surface treatment, and functionalization. And then we can make an assessment if different forms in the sense of, let's say, different grades of a material um, are sufficiently similar so that we can lump them together and we have to assess them not one by one, but together. That's much more complicated than what it seems like because, first of all, you need to be able to measure things, but then you need to assess them. And for that second part, we um, have developed the Acetoc Nano app. And I really think that 10 years ago, this would not have been possible. Um, but now, with the progress of the last decade, we dare to propose a framework that has fixed methods and science-based assessment criteria and completed case studies. Um, you can also explore it yourself. It's a free online tool and both the rationale um, and also the um, case studies have been um, made public. So this is what you can find here. You can also research it. In essence, what it does, it takes the guidance and converts it into something that is transparent because it provides you an output that you, um, lists all the rationale and the data that was used for simple decisions where it's sufficient to only look at the overlap of size distributions, for instance, a decision is taking on simple fist chem properties, but then for not so similar materials, you will get an orange thumb here telling you that grouping in one set of similar nanoforms may be possible. You have to escalate, you have to provide more data, or it may tell you that it's just not sufficiently similar. We have iterated this with ECHA, um, where it's now um, re publicly available. There have been training sessions for industry. And what I find interesting here is that the most important decisions are taken on interaction parameters. So on the dissolution kinetics, on reactivity, on cell-based in vitro toxicity, and on two measures of the both environmental or human perspective of exposure. Especially for these methods, though, we don't have a commonly available method. So we had to rely on academic evidence, on collaborative projects to demonstrate useful uh, methods. We also lack suitable re representative test materials, let alone certified reference materials. This would be highly needed. Although there's a lack, there's also progress. Um, at OECD level, numerous um, projects are going on to establish new guidelines. Uh, we also participate in uh, the development of some of them because robustness is our biggest concern. We want to make sure that another competitor comes to the same um, result as we do. We want to make sure that regulatory agencies don't 
generate a year-long or decade-long discussion about validity results, because we have seen that. Instead, we want to have methods that are generally accepted. And so this OECD process, although slow, is incredibly important. Looking at the results, um, we have made a small interlab comparison in the frame of Gracious, and you can see the different labs that participated here. So JSC is um, the um, lab of the European Commission in ISPRA. Later it is an independent research organization. Um, University of Vienna, Nurion is um, a silica producer, um, and CH is the UK-based Center for Ecology and Hydrology. A simple case is BET, very well-established commercial equipments. We get a max standard deviation that is very low, 3% relative error, everyone's happy. It's not so easy with impurities by our ICP MS or OS. The main constituents everyone can measure. But what about impurities? Some of them were not measured at all in some labs. They were measured in other labs. So what is relevant? The big question here is what's biologically relevant? Do we need to care about PPB levels of impurities? Another um, issue of reproducibility touches on my second topic, um, which is the release during the life cycle. And we have been looking at the release both by um, weathering conditions, sanding conditions, incineration, et cetera, in an expert panel that has worked over many years, roughly 2010 to 15. Up to 300 people were involved. And you see a photograph of some of the key people. I just want to mention Miriam Hill from um, Health Canada, with whom I had the pleasure to coordinate the project for two years before others took over. And we are quite happy to see that finally this year, the ISO um, technical report, so it's not a specification, it's a TR, has been published. Um, it's an extensive report that touches on the methodology of assessing the release during um, the life cycle of materials. And although we have performed the reproducibility testing on the weathering or, um, in, reported in 2016, by now we have many more applications. So we have been looking at copper-based uh, wood protection. We have been looking at automotive um, coatings um, using outdoor weathering and indoor NIST methods. We have been looking with EPA on the structures that form under different uh, materials. We looked at automotive coatings again with different pigments, nano and non-nano. We extended the method to food contact with BFR um, in Germany. The beauty is. When you put all this together, there is some systematics. At the bottom here, you see a log scale of releases over um, the um, outdoor weathering. And never mind about the actual numbers, what's important here is the color code. The light blue stuff and the dark blue stuff is not intermixed, but all of the polyurethane-based materials, regardless of the filler, regardless of the year of production, they lump together in this range. The polyethylene, maybe like you would expect, is at the lowest end. Cement is actually at the highest end. Epoxy is at the high end. Um, the gray stuff here is polyamide. So this was very good to see. The method is reproducible over many years, and there is a systematic, um, the polymer matrix is most important here. A similar attempt to standardize methods was made for sanding. Um, and it has not worked for many years. Um, the nano release project had trouble tremendously. These are the results from different labs. So three color codes on 15 different materials. It does work. They do fall onto one master curve if you benchmark all results to one material. In that case, we benchmarked this to epoxy. But as you see, we could have benchmarked it to anyone else. Um, so finally, also, um, this gap is being closed, and we know how to assess mechanical releases. Let me come to my third and last um, issue. We need these methods not only for the conventional nanomaterials. We also need them for the more complex, more um, advanced materials. An example of such is the aerogel insulation. It's actually around me in my office here. Um, in the window sides, you don't have much space. You can't use conventional insulation, you use aerogels because they only require one third of the insulation thickness. 
these are not nanomaterials by reach. Um, they are nanostructured, internally structured materials. And so there is a legitimate concern to ask what happens when people perform all those operations. So we simulated it in the lab. This is the exact same mini clean room. And here you see the sanding disk. And here you see aerosol equipment to quantify releases. The same one that we used before for the simple systems, including the nano release work. And now we use it for the more complex materials. When you put this thing into operation, you see this hazy dust. So there's a whole lot of aerosol emitted. Actually, there's no hazard of the fragments. We published this um, with uh, Phil Democrat at Harvard. Um, but it shows you that those methods are transferable. And now we come back to the Kemper car. It shows a whole range of different advanced materials that BSF has developed over the years. It's actually a real car that exists. Um, um, it is not yet commercial. Uh, it's a demo car together with um, a, a camper manufacturer. And the interesting thing here is that nano is just one technology of many. Some of these advanced materials are made by additive manufacturing. Some use unusual stoichiometries. Some use organic, inorganic um, composites. Some rely on nanostructures. Some rely on several of these technologies. So I think the, interest, you know, the important part here is to adapt our assessment to the concern. And for that, I'd like to mention that um, in the nanomat framework, which has various authors, both from industry and academia here, we contributed also to um, this recent book here on metrology and standardization for nanotechnology. And we have put forward some arguments that this concept of generations, although it was popular in the year 2000, so 20 years ago, it is not really so valuable anymore. It has never been an industry roadmap. Um, and also, if you look at the um, most recent ECHA report on the so-called next generation nanomaterials, they don't find much urgency on um, what was described initially as advanced generations. So instead of that, I think we should look at the trends we see in industry right now, which means that some of those advanced materials flexibly use nanotech, some don't. Very often also, and that's completely underestimated by the original concept, we more and more make nanostructures without using particles. Instead, we use reactive processes. We use surface-based processes. So for us, it's very important that both the nanometrology and nanosafety have become standard tools which we can use if we need them. So let me summarize here my initial remarks. Um, what do we know? Based on the last decade and the last two decades maybe, we now have frameworks for the assessment of nanomaterials. We have already some and upcoming many more OECD test guidelines, which are applicable to particles. And we hope that they will also be applicable to the nano-enabled products for which especially life cycle releases are interesting because in some cases only then you deal with a nanostructure. Our current focus is a lot on fulfilling regulatory requirements for fillers and pigments, which constitute most of the nanoform um, materials under uh, reach. Reproducibility is an issue. It's on the order of 10% for those relatively simple um, uh, properties, which by the way is also interesting for the EPA concept of discrete forms. The reproducibility is not that good. It's more on the order of twofold for properties that I think should really be at the center of assessment, which describe interactions. So we might discuss um, later on whether that is okay um, for them, from the perspective of metrology or risk assessment. And we do see that trend that we use nanotech more flexibly. Concerns may arise from many conditions, among them nanostructures and from that we need to know how to deal with embedded internal nano components, multiple, uh, multiple components. Interestingly, I didn't mention that yet, there's lots of synergy here because the same characterization tools are also needed for the actual development of these materials, for structure property relationships or for modeling and predictive modeling. 
So I'm looking forward um, to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Wendell. That was an excellent presentation. We'll now move on to Joanne Shatkin's presentation. Joanne, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Joanne Shatkin, and I'm very pleased to be part of today's uh, webinar. Um, just uh, I just briefly uh, want to give you a bit of background about my organization. Um, I founded Vario Advisors in 2013 to bring the best available science to demonstrate the safety of emerging technologies um, that can contribute to a more sustainable economy. So even though we're a, a, a private organization, we, we are on a mission to try to get better materials into the economy. And so... We've sought from the start to look across the product life cycle and think about safety um, and, and health and, and environmental risks across the product life cycle. Um, so we work with both public and private organizations um, to um, reduce the risks of innovation and address requirements in different markets for environmental health and safety. Um, rely on a, a very broad network. Many of you are, are um, on today's webinar, and um, we um, so we work with you know directly with organizations, um, but also build and and work with consortia, um, and have found that to be an effective way to um, uh, generate new knowledge and acceptance of methods. Um, for example, uh, example. So some of my key themes. Um, I, I think there's a lot of overlap between Wendell's perspective and mine, but. We've accomplished a lot on particle measurement and characterization, um, and uh, particularly in characterizing occupational exposure and, and health risk, and also um, advancing our understanding of uh, to uh, toxicology associated with uh, nanoparticles. Um, but characterization is still challenging. It remains a particular challenge for carbon-based nanomaterials, as well as multi-component materials, non-spherical particles and other types of nanostructured uh, materials. Um, and so looking forward, um, we need to continue or increase our focus on realistic exposures to the, the products that end up in our society that, we're, that we use and that consumers are using and that can end up in the environment. And, and so what are those realistic conditions and what are people actually exposed to um, both for nanostructured materials and other types of advanced technologies across the product life cycle. And there, there is, um, I believe, a, a need to further advance the methods to screen and group materials for that nano-specific characterization um, and, and, and to be proactive, but, but, but still that sort of elusive, what is, what is relevant um, from, from the nano perspective. Um, so what have we accomplished? Um, a lot, and particularly in the last decade, I think we have really honed in on what to measure, um, uh, what characteristics of particles are critical to their behavior. Um, but um, I think we still have work to do in, in the how we do those measurements and, and when it, we need to be doing those. So we have a, a long list of metrics, but um, I think my experience in, in trying to conduct some of these studies is that we tend to turn to academic labs for some of them. They're, they're not standards available for as many, um, despite the fact that we, we, we do have um, so many uh, standards available today. Um, you know, just the ISO um, TC229 committee, just one committee at the, um, at the international level um, having published 83 standards already with another 56 ongoing um, efforts. That's just one. Uh, you know, OECD has published 97 reports out of the, the working party on manufactured nanomaterials. Not all of these are methods, um, uh, uh, but many of those reports have focused on it. I and mean, we, We're very pleased to have been part of, of five of those, but there's a significant amount of work going on with that working party on nano, manufactured nanomaterials. And 
Um, just as another example, the, the ASTM uh, committee has um, got more than 16 uh, standards, but there's still so much more work to do um, to standardize how we do the, the characterization and, and be able to compare um, different types of exposure and, and uh, materials to one another. Um, there, we do have a recognition that sample preparation is critical um, that in, in order to be able to, to compare different materials or, or work from different laboratories. Um, clearly, particle surface properties are critical uh, to their to understanding um, uh, and characterizing their behavior. And um, I think it's it's fair to say today the toxicity studies have found very few um, novel effects, but different exposure characteristics for for nano particles. Um, and as we heard about uh, from Wendell, the exposure characterization has advanced significantly where we now have um, uh, a significant body of uh, methods available for occupational exposure uh, characterization and uh, nano release uh, studies. Um, exciting to have seen that milestone this year um, after having been involved in the early discussions on nano release. Um, and um, uh, together, I mean, built a significant uh, body of work that demonstrates that when you look at all the potential exposure scenarios, very, very few of them are to free particles. Um, so I, I think there are many challenges that still remain, including the, the relationship of these various particle properties to safety um, and the predictability of that. Um, the, um, the majority of toxic ecology studies that are available are on a relatively few number of um, materials. These are often nanoscale versions of conventional materials. Uh, it's a very large database um, with, you know, very relatively few uh, substances uh, in it. Um, and so the, the characterization uh, of size for non-spherical uh, particles is still uh, really challenging um, when you get into high aspect ratio materials and and complex morphologies with with different chemistries um, uh, included. Um, we've bumped into in, in many contexts um, measurements being made in biological media, and those are very challenging to to quantify. Um, typically for for low uh, exposure levels and. Um, there are still relatively few studies with appropriately characterized materials um, when you look to the literature for, for answers. Um, uh, so that remains a challenge. Um, and I want to delve a little bit into the, the challenges associated with carbon-based nanomaterials, including organic uh, substances. And um, I, I think we've had much less focus on these nanostructured and other advanced uh, materials, uh, technologies, and nano-enabled technologies. Um, so um, for carbon-based nanomaterials, uh, I want to keep this at a very high level because I just have a few minutes to speak, but for carbon, nanom uh, carbon nanotubes, um, occupational health and safety measurements are uh, remain challenging uh, in terms of distinguishing from, from background in terms of um, measuring elemental carbon. Um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of an indirect measure. Um, it, it's great that there's an available method uh, now for that, but um, still challenging. Uh, graphene and other 2D materials are, um, are partly a challenge because it's difficult to define what is graphene and what isn't. There are many materials out there that are not, you know, that are not um, graphene according to graphene producers. Um, so that that makes it challenging to distinguish what the properties are, how you uh, adequately measure the size. Is it, you know, the number of layers? Is it the, the thickness? How do you, what are the appropriate characteristics of the nano and then larger scale that that are um, meaningful. Um, there's not a standard approach uh, for that today. So this is not only affects how you do a safety evaluation, but also commercialization, how you communicate about what materials you are producing uh, and how they behave. And um, yeah, for those of you who, who are familiar with, with our work at Vario, where we do a lot of work on cellulose nanomaterials, and these are carbohydrates. They're 
they're uh, glucose molecules that are, um, you know, beta um, uh, glycosidic links between them and they're carbohydrates and they're ubiquitous in the environment and very uh, challenging to detect. Um, I did want to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about a project that we are coordinating. Um, it's uh, a group called the Alliance for Food Safety Acceptance of Fibrillated, uh, Crystalline and Fibrillated Celluloses. And, and the structure is a public-private partnership. There are 10 partners, uh, seven of them are companies, and the others are um, governmental or, or private uh, foundations. And it's a, a pre-commercial project where we're uh, working together to develop methods and data to demonstrate the safety of um, these uh, novel cellulose materials <clears throat> um, with a particular focus on in the ingestion route and, um, and um, use in, in food. And so we're seeking to demonstrate safety by both conventional and, and novel uh, testing approaches and uh, working to standardize both methods and develop data sets um, for conventional forms of cellulose that have been commercial for decades and don't have these kind of data available for them. Um, and being able to link those in, into a, a, a grouping um, and read across uh, strategy for uh, with side-by-side -side in vivo and in vitro testing. Um, and there are many aspects to this. Um, as I mentioned, the, the characterization, being able to both detect uh, cellulose in biological media, for example, um, is enormously challenging. Um, we've spent years labeling these materials and sorting that out um, and, and working out methods for digestion assays and, and alternative testing strategy among others um, in order to build supporting data, um, as, as I mentioned, in academic laboratories that, uh, that can support the um, good laboratory practice uh, traditional toxicology studies that are done in GLP, good laboratory practice, commercial laboratories. Um, and so, you know, the idea is that we can, we'll have these methods and these data available for conventional and, and the fibrillated and also the nanocrystalline forms um, that we can then apply to the next generation of materials as they are uh, functionalized. Um, but just uh, to, to offer some perspective, you can see from the size range that for at least for the fibrillated uh, materials, and these are from the University of Maine Pilot uh, <clears throat> Process Development Center there, um, that they are similar in scale to celluloses isolated from produce, from fruits and vegetables. Um, but, you know, we get into how do we describe these materials in a way that shows their macro and micro and nano characteristics. And you can see the individual fibrils, which have a nanoscale width, um, but, but you don't see um, them uh, as free uh, fibers. You see them as part of a larger structure. And so it's been challenging to um, come up with a strategy to uh, demonstrate the, the behavior of these materials, but also their, their key uh, physical and chemical characteristics. Um, so what's next? What, what areas um, can we focus on uh, to characterize uh, uh, materials to uh, focus on nanostructured and other advanced materials and nano-enabled uh, technologies rather than free nanoparticles, uh, which had been the concern uh, a decade or more ago. Um, there's a need for critical dosimetry and characterization metrics for advanced materials um, that you know, will have nano characteristics but are not, uh, not nano in three dimensions. And so these are you know, the more complex materials um, that are, could be active or self-assembled or um, build on these convergent uh, technologies. Um, and, um, you know, these are, in, um, we're, we're kind of conceptual, um, back, uh, more than a decade ago, they, um, um, I, you know, the idea that they go through different stages of development, um, is different from, you know, from a, a, a single type of chemistry, I think. And, um, and so how do we address exposure under realistic conditions to these more 
um, complex materials that are um, uh, have nano uh, as part of the component, but maybe produced differently. The, the methods we're using could be a bit more um, uh, um, <clears throat> um, challenging for us to sort out what we use from the nano domain uh, into these more complicated materials. Um, also, addressing exposure under realistic conditions, we're going to be manufacturing differently. We already are um, in the fourth IR, um, for example, with 3D printing. And so um, sorting out what concentration levels to run our studies at that, that maybe are realistic for people who are manufacturing or who may be using products that contain the materials. Um, and I think there is still a need to increase focus on exposure beyond the occupational environment, um, looking at, at products in use and post-use. And those post-uses, there's still a lot of work to do for, to characterize those. I also think that the grouping methods um, and being able to validate new approach methods is a, a critical need for us to be able to limit animal testing in the future. Um, when it's not necessary. And obviously we need to continue our standards work and uh, encourage more uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll quit there and I guess we'll go into discussion from here. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. That was very insightful, really well done. Um, so it's time to move to our Q&A session. For today's webinar. Uh, again, uh, please use the Q&A box on your screen to submit any questions. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative here to lead off the Q&A with a, a few questions of my own. Um, I guess this will start start with Wendell and then and Joanne, you can feel free to follow up. Um, <clears throat> since we have a panelist from the EU, uh, as well as one from the US today. Uh, I think it's uh, pertinent to ask each of you to comment on how the US and the EU have worked together over this past decade, let's say, to tackle measurement challenges in nano EHS. And you know, feel free to uh, mention any particular, um, uh, and particularly important examples of how this has been done. Wendell? Well, the, the most important venue, not only for EU and US, but also other countries remains the OECD working party. Um, this is really where results are being generated or let's say methods are established that we can rely on. But I also think that individually, there are very important areas of progress of so this project that we have been mentioning, Nano Release, it would not have been possible in the EU, not, not with that focus from so many agencies, um, not with that um, determination to, to, to come to an end, simply because the relevance of exposure is much more dominant in assessments on the US side, whereas in Europe, we, I think we do develop um, good progress on what Joanne also mentioned, grouping um, um, mechanisms, frameworks and case studies for grouping. So these are two elements that I think are individually very important progress. And imp interestingly, I think each of them are collaborative projects. It's, it's not an individual agency or um, um, industry or, uh, it, or, or even country. It's it's the collaboration on these two big topics. Thanks, Joanne. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Wendell um, on the importance of OECD and was thinking about the collaboration between the, the Dutch government and EPA on um, a decision framework for particle characterization as, as one example of, you know, how bringing those different perspectives of different regulatory agencies together um, help to frame uh, how characterization can occur. So I think examples like that. Um, I also think the, 
the US EU core, the communities of research um, advanced some interesting projects um, more along the, the research side of things uh, than policy. But um, I do think the, the respective focus on uh, kind of screening models uh, that Europe has, has had um, compared with um, a, a greater focus on exposure characterization here in the US has been really um, uh, complementary. Um, and I hope those collaborations will, will continue. Thank you. Um, so you, you both actually touched on this, this, this idea of <clears throat> a changing paradigm uh, with respect to advanced materials, let's say nanostructured materials, uh, as well as advanced manufacturing processes like 3D printing. So there's 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 kind of an ongoing debate in a lot of areas right now. I know we're having this discussion within NIST. Uh, we've had this discussion within ASTM, I think, as well as ISO 229. Um, sort of a debate about the relationship between nanomaterials uh, in quotes and advanced materials in quotes and and what nanomaterials mean in this context um, could, would you both mind commenting on uh, so this seems like a really important time uh, to address this issue would you would you mind commenting on the place of nanomaterials and nano EHS in this emerging realm of advanced materials and advanced manufacturing and we'll start with Joanne Thanks, Vince. I, I mean, I think there's a few things from the nano world that are relevant here. Um, uh, first of all, the, the models and collaborations that have been built um, should be retained and continued, that, you know, instead of reinventing a wheel for what might be considered a new problem, simply, I think, refocusing uh, the, the current um, uh, infrastructure, if you will, uh, networks of, of researchers and, and models of collaboration um, is is helpful, um, and also kind of the, the almost real time aspect of trying to answer some of these questions um, in a forward looking way is is helpful. Um, in particular, I think um, you know there, there's some recent guidance out of the European Food Safety Authority of, uh, on um, particles and uh, technical guidelines uh, and. Um, uh, technical requirements for those, and I, I think um, what's what's interesting there is uh, I think it's the first guidance. I'm uh, well, I, I take that back. It's not. EPA has also put out a similar kind of guidance saying these are conventional particles that are small. These are these have unique and novel properties, and you need to treat them differently. And I think that kind of thinking is helpful and informative toward how we think about it, what's an advanced material and, and how does that relate to nanoscale? Because size isn't the appropriate metric. It's more that there are properties that they behave differently from materials that we've studied for a long time. Hello. To some extent, I completely disagree. Um, <laughs> um, That's what makes it I interesting. Think, uh, I think it is a mistake to see the debate of advanced materials as a continuation of the nano debate. Instead, I um, think that nanomaterials, if they are in a novel use that has not been explored before, um, if they have been invented in the last, let's say, decade, could be considered advanced materials. But that excludes all the conventional fillers, pigments. It even excludes carbon nanotubes. Um, um, I think advanced materials um, can use many technologies and many of these are simply not nano. Um, think of all the intelligent polymers, um, self-healing surfaces. Um, if you look into any issue of the dedicated journal advanced materials, you will find lots of these examples. Also, it's important, most advanced materials are not particles. Um, and again, so this is a, a very big difference from the situation that we had for the nanomaterial discussion. And so 
for selected concerns, when you know that the degradation of an advanced material generates nanoscale fragments, then, okay, then it's adequate to answer that concern with a nano method, but not in the other cases. I, I want to clarify what I said because I, if, if Wendell misunderstood it, others may have as well, that I, I was suggesting using the infrastructure that's been built around nanomaterials to shift focus to materials that have advanced characteristics. I was not suggesting that you treat advanced materials as nanomaterials. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience, so um, let's switch over to the Q&A. Um, what other processing of nanomaterials need to be evaluated to determine impacts and release potential? And the examples given are electron beams, microwaves, laser cutting, edging, uh, etching, milling, or grinding. So I guess I, I think the question is what other uh, processing um, tools that might generate um, something that needs to be measured and assessed in terms of risk uh, should be considered or evaluated. And I guess we can start with um, with with Wendell on that. Hmm. Yeah, the, the, the question includes part of the answer because, yeah. John, you're asking for high energy input um, um, such as by microwaves, laser cutting, milling or grinding. And I think this is what we would look for. Um, high stresses on the material, um, high intensity, um, which um, I cannot answer in a generalized um, uh, fashion. I, I think your keywords are correct. Um, these are the kinds of processes that I would look for. But for any process, it's all about how it's being done, whether it's encapsulated and also what kind of material is dealt with. Is this about a heavy metal? Then I would have many more concerns than when this is about, let's say, um, a polymer um, or um, a, a silicon dioxide based material, then maybe all of these processes are okay. Joe, do you have a comment on that? No, just, you know, I think they, um... Uh, you know, when we when we've looked at uh, materials that have either nano coating or nano component to them and, and been concerned about release, it was uh, what kinds of uh, processes the the users were going to be uh, employing, right. and, and we would just test those, including a simple cutting, you know, where you might be really creating a frayed end. So, could I add something? Sure. Um, just one more keyword that's transformative um, um, mechanisms. The, some of those that you mentioned might be counted, but include incineration maybe, or chemically aggressive environments. Um, that raises a whole lot of questions because then you release something that's different from what you put into the process. This is maybe even more interesting in a general way. I would agree. Um, this is an interesting question. Thank you. The, the, the questioner thanks both of you for the presentations, by the way. Um, could you comment on the regulatory perspective where the nano EHS area is going in this sense? And the questioner says, here in Brazil, we feel like we're waiting for the, regula for the regulation uh, posture to, I guess, settle out. So can you comment on um, the regulatory perspective, but really hasn't come up, I don't think, too much in the presentation specifically. And we'll start with Joanne. Um, yes, thanks for the question. I, I mean, I think um, what, what we see is a continued evolution. Um, you know, uh, Wendell referred to the, the nano form um, uh, portion of uh, REACH and um, uh, so ECOB and also EFSA have um, have sought to refine their approaches to nanomaterials more specifically. Um, I think, you know, things in the U.S. have been in process for some time, but I, I don't think that means there's an end to how we're regulating and, and whether there's a specific uh, consideration of nanoforms and, and which ones. Um, 
and and the situation you know globally is um, is quite variable. So I think it's a continued evolving landscape that you know more and more countries that look to EU, for example, uh, to follow regulations are likely to adopt some of some of those uh, requirements. And um, I don't I I don't think we're settled on a on a particular uh, a way, including how we define what what nanomaterials are, what nanoparticles are. Wendell? Yeah, the, it, it's not easy to answer this question on a global perspective. Um, let, let me take a European perspective then. Sure. Um, for us, it was a, a major change when in the January of 2020, it became mandatory to report nanoforms under reach <clears throat> because this creates um, a level of transparency on ideally on the level of grades. So even if you produce something in your site in Italy <clears throat> and you produce the same product on your site in France, you still have to report both of them individually. Um, that creates also pressure to study and investigate these materials at an unprecedented scale. Um, at the same time, it has created some certainty. We, we know what to deal with now. Um, it also creates a better level playing field between competitors. So there are some advantages on that. Um, since then, a major drawback is the different definition of what's a nanomaterial under different regulations. So for a biocide, a different, a different definition than for cosmetics, than for general chemicals. And then there are the national inventories. Um, in Canada, there is some reporting rule. There was one imp uh, implied by EPA, one by France, one by Belgium. They all use different definitions, which is a whole lot of confusion because to some customer, you have to say, this is a nanomaterial. And you market the same stuff in another country or for a, a, a different purpose, and then it's not a nanomaterial anymore. That's not understandable to our customers. So, boy, we have a lot of questions now. <laughs> um, do fundamentals of structure activity relationships apply or other, or are there other factors, parameters that need to be applied in assessing health effects of nanomaterials. And we can start with, with Wendell. There might be some people in the audience who are better positioned to answer this, but um, I think many of the modeling approaches that try to predict health effects based on um, crystalline structures or stoichiometries or whatever else you would consider a fundamental description fail. Um, that doesn't work. Maybe simply because our models are not good enough or maybe because the input data is not good enough. The solution to the problem is to directly measure interactions in what we would call functional assays or by in vitro um, testing. Um, that I think is, is necessary for quite some time. Um, but we still see systematic trends. So by changing crystalline species, changing surface areas, um, we do see systematic behavior, um, scaling laws, but not quantitative predictions, I think. Joanne, do you have a comment on that? Um, not, just, on. The, just, just the um, uh, SARS and QSARS, um, you know, work better, I would say, for, you know, and, and just for chemicals on an environmental, uh, in predicting environmental behavior more so than, than toxicity. And I think those, the challenges of adding the particle dimension to that are not insurmountable, but not. Uh, completely ready for modeling at this stage, although I know there is significant ongoing work in that direction. So I, th I think there's a there's an opportunity for that. I, I don't think it's uh, fully formed science today. It's, it's an area for investigation. Thanks. Can you both reflect on why there are no health-based guideline values for oral exposures to persistent small particles? Uh, Joanne. 
Sure. Um, so I, I think um, I think there's still uh, some outstanding um, questions about behavior of small particles uh, following oral exposure um, and, and reflecting kind of the, the state of understanding of that science at all, where there's, there's a microbiome interaction, for example, and, and coming back to this um, you know, are these simply small particles or, or is there some nano specific um, aspect of them uh, that affects their behavior? I don't think there's a, a sound understanding today of um, what properties are would be critical to defining that group necessarily. Um, uh, but I think um, it, it's a great question to look at and one that ought to be prioritized. Wendell? I think this one is not for me to answer. We'll leave it with Joanne. Sure. Um, this is an interesting question to me. Actually, I, I, I would, wouldn't mind asking it myself. Um, so there's the, the, the question is that there's an ongoing challenge um, we face. I'm assuming this is primarily companies, industry. Uh, when working with companies that um, to characterize nanomaterials. So even though there are standards, some standards available uh, and methods available um, to look at exposure, release, et cetera, uh, there are a few, very few commercial testing labs that are performing this work. So the question is essentially, you know, finding this expertise to complete the, this, this type of characterization is very challenging. Um, what are the panel's thoughts on how to improve industry's access to the expertise and the instrumentation and, and uh, to complete this kind of uh, measurement need? This is really a measurement question. And I would say, go ahead, Wendell, and, and start things off. It is an interesting question. Um, looking at it from a commercial perspective, all those, um, um, contract laboratories, they need to see a sustained value in setting up the methodology, um, which means that they would need to know how many studies are being ordered over which time of um, the, the coming years. When speaking to some, they develop specific tests for specific purposes, but they don't always have a customer base because also in, in Europe, that's what we see. Only um, with that, I mentioned it already, 2020 REACH revision, companies have really started to systematically um, look into um, these properties. It, it has required that regulatory pressure. Um, on the other hand, um, what, what bugs me is that I still can't rely on the results of those outside labs if they don't show proficiency. And that is a question that goes also back to Vince um, because reference materials are also still missing for many of the properties that are important now, which is much more than just size and composition. It, it's more about um, the um, biological properties also. Joanne? I mean, I'll just say, you know, that's this is one of the frustrating areas that's made me want to, you know, open a lab <laughs> because it's very, you know, with all of the consolidation that that's occurred over the last uh, decade or so with commercial laboratories, it's it, a lot of the expertise in in this kind of specialized testing has has gone away, and um, I, with it with increased focus on you know certification and, and standards and. Um, um, uh, you know, I agree. There needs to be some kind of uh, um, market pull for uh, for for someone to have the the will to to go forward with that. Yeah, and I I since since Wendell um, mentioned Nest, um, I, I feel I probably should respond at least. Um, yeah, this is this is a serious question, and it's a serious issue. Um, I, and we've had these discussions within the standards development organizations. Um, for instance, in ASTM, uh, a test method requires 
an inner laboratory study and a precision and bias statement to go with that document. But it's difficult to obtain a precision and bias statement if the standards don't exist to um, standards in terms of reference materials. Uh, the reference standards don't exist to you know, depend the results of those tests. And so, and there's a reason for that because um, it's actually a difficult and lengthy process to develop a reference material, especially a certified reference material as, um, as many of you probably are aware, um, also costly. Um, developing one that's, for instance, in a, um, a complex media or um, defining specific biological properties um, increases that uh, difficulty by probably a couple orders of magnitude. And uh, there's also a bit of a catch-32 situation where it's difficult to produce the standard and assign values if you don't have the standard methods. And it's difficult to validate the standard methods if you don't have the reference materials. So I, I will leave my leave you with that thought from me. Um, are there extensions to draw between exposure grouping um, and functional assay measures of potency. An example is, you know, like we do now for dioxins or PCBs or, uh, you know, molecular uh, structures per se. Um, Joanne, why don't you tackle this first? Um, I, I hope so. Um, I think there's there's a lot of work to do on the functional assay. Uh, arena and um, advancing those those methods. Uh, we're just starting a project where we're doing beginning systematic functionalization of, of materials and trying to look at, you know, as you increase the, the amount of functionalization, when do you get to a point where you can say this no longer belongs in the group? What kinds of assays do you do? You do? Um, uh, and I, I think there, there is some good uh, science out there now, it, there's a lot of work to do to bring that to a more um, widely agreed approach. Wendell? I'm not sure if this is really the right answer, but um, it's interesting to look at the the level of predictivity that you have by just looking at compositions and chemical structures. So in the somehow this links back to the question we had earlier about predictivity and calculations. Um, and I think we're only making progress there in well-defined categories of materials. We we can't do this in general, but we can do it by looking at variations of something we know. Um, and this should be explored certainly for the more um, focused materials with, that are more in the, in the focus of interest. Thanks. Uh, this next question um, is, is really interesting to me because I, I just recently read through um, the European Food Agency, uh, Food Safety Agency's uh, document that came out, at least it was adopted in August uh, of this year, <clears throat> which uh, uh, addressed in part um, the type of information and the approach to applying that to the development of safety, um, material safety sheets, for instance, for materials or products. So the, the question is, um, since regulation typically lags technology, how does a risk assessor slash manager uh, and SDS author determine what to advise about the end of product life care and SDS and similar guidance? Joanne, would you mind addressing that? It's a great question, and it's a really difficult one to to make general responses to. I, you know, I think um, looking at the available information on toxicity in, uh, in the environment or from the environment for the particular substance, considering the uh, the product, you know, the, the product that the um, uh, SDS is representing, what kind of uh, uses it has. Um, uh, you know, a, a wide use, or is it an industrially uh, used substance? Is it going to enter a, um, 
you know, a, a product that is highly controlled, like a cell phone, uh, where you wouldn't have a release uh, at the end of life. I, I, those are the kinds of considerations that that you know you, you'd want to consider um, handling um, recommendations for. Wendell, especially yeah, from the EU side, there will be additional requirements um, to report properties for nanomaterials on <clears throat> safety data sheets um, that will enter into force relatively soon, which will help people to understand what they have at hand. Um, but the other issue about the extrapolation of end of life intended use, that really is not a nano specific issue. It's something that you could have for any chemical. Um, you cannot make in general, predictions on that, of course. Um, so I, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. Um, and, and this, I, I think, would go to Joanne specifically. Um, has anybody considered studying how the ingestion of nanomaterials such as cellulose affect the bi microbiome and may contribute to leaky gut syndrome as a toxicological effect. I know that there's been some work in this area, but I'm not familiar with it. There have been some studies um, that, that I'm, I'm familiar with researchers at the University of, of Georgia who've looked at this issue um, among others. And, um, uh, you know, the, the the specific question that was that was investigated is whether there's an interaction with the mucosal layer of the gastrointestinal tract um, in vivo and, and in vitro. And, and there was not much interaction at all with the muc mucosal layer, which suggests there would be a limited effect. Um, you know, from a chemical perspective, cellulose um, uh, is um, insoluble in the gut and uh, at least uh, there are insoluble forms that, let's say it that way, um, that, uh, that um, we uh, as humans don't have the ability to digest. We don't have the cellulose enzyme. So um, one would not expect that, um, uh, you know, unless we uh, somehow um, have uh, biota in our micro microbes in our um, gastrointestinal systems that contain the enzyme cellulase, uh, likely there's there's very limited breakdown of those that would allow them to be um, absorbed. Um, leaky gut syndrome, I, I don't think this is an appropriate venue to, to talk about, um, but I, do, I think from an exposure perspective, we would not uh, anticipate that um, any form of, of a fiber that can't cross the, the, the barrier um, of the gastrointestinal tract is, is not likely to have those effects. Wendell, you're you're welcome to also comment on that if you wish. That's fine. That's fine. Um, actually, this question is, is specifically for you, Wendell. Um, I'm interested in further understanding the work, your work, <clears throat> mentioned with aerogel insulation. Uh, what lessons should insulation workers take away from that research? I guess at this point in time. Yeah. Um, the interesting point is that there are so many alternatives um, for insulation you could use. Polymer foams, you could use um, wooden wools, you could use glass wool, stone wool, you could use porous stones or aerogels. Um, from the work that we have done and published, um, we find that there is a considerable release of small fragments from aerogels when you treat them. And the treatments that we simulated are meant to be realistic um, for what happens on a construction site, so sawing or drilling. However, we also tested the hazard or the at least the um, toxicity of, of these materials, which was found to be very low. Um, in that regard, it is um, an unusual um, exposure situation, but it does not seem to pose a major risk. Um, there is also debate about 
alternatives. Think about the fibers released when you use a fiber-based um, uh, uh, wool um, material, um, where you might also want to know more about how these um, behave. Um, we still continue to look into these materials. We, and in fact, we are running a project called Harmless, which is all about so-called safer by design um, uh, formulations, which means that early on during the development, you perform screening tests of both hazard and exposure, and iteratively, you try to optimize that balance between performance and uh, risk. Aerogels are one of our case studies um, because maybe they can still be optimized. Um, there are even completely different purely organic aerogels. So I think that's an interesting question to ask. I don't see a red flag, um, but I see alternatives. Thank you. We're going to ask go to one more question from uh, our attendees, and then I have a wrap-up question for both of you. Uh, so we're at the uh, actually just under five minute mark. Can you get perhaps a brief response to this question? Any approach to control banding to group release potential for different materials or product categories and um, examples being you know, encaps encapsulated in different matrices, uh, surface deposited or bonded uh, or laminated into another structure, interior layers. Um, I would say go ahead, Wendell, and start off on that. Again, you're giving half of the answer, which is, and I agree, um, the, the way or the structure that incorporates the um, nanomaterial is the first important point. And there is one approach from um, the um, Dutch um, database that uses exactly this kind of categorization. Um, I forgot the name um, of this nano risk cat, I think um, is that name. I would go a step further um, because our research has shown that the matrix is incredibly important. It's much less about the size or composition of the nanomaterial, the, the matrix, whether it's a stiff or soft material, that, that is very important. So this would be my second qualifier. Joanne, do you have a, a brief response to that? No, I, um, I, would, I would point back to, to the work that Wendell and his colleagues have, have developed that, that shows that, um, you know, unless there's a, a um, that uses, uses are important and matrix is important. Okay. So I, I wanna ask one, one final question and we only have about three minutes. So um, your answer uh, would need to be somewhat brief, but what would you have done differently 10 years ago, uh, knowing what you know now? So for instance, would you have prioritized needs differently? And uh, this question is obviously to both of you. We can start with Joanne. Um. <laughs> I, Don't feel I guess. Any uh, yeah, no, I, I think um, you know, I think things have things have taken a lot longer to develop than I imagined. My, you know, my initial business plan, I thought, well, nano will become standardized within a you know a couple of years, and and so I better you know build up some some expertise beyond that. But there's still a significant number of kind of nano regulatory safety questions that that. Um, are, are needed uh, to be answered. Um, and so I guess, you know, I, I might have, um, um, I might have started my own laboratory <laughs> instead of trying to rely on collaborators to do the, the research. I think, um, that, you know, that there's so many questions still um, that um, it's hard, uh, it's, it's hard to always build collaborations around. Um, but also I think I would have, um, you know, uh, considered longer term planning around some of the the research projects we engaged in um, because they're they're not as far along as I imagined they would be today. Wendell, I wish I had discovered earlier the value of comparative testing, and I've said it before a few times reference materials. Um, I think we have been trying for too long to find the truth and the um, the the ultimate method. Um, I think we still don't have that, but we are quite good now in rankings and comparisons. Um, that I think is um, 
now still ongoing. Um, we could have started that earlier. And I'll add my own answer to that question. I, with respect to reference materials, um, I think if I could go back, I would have put a greater emphasis on trying to develop uh, private, uh, public private um, collaborative efforts towards the development of reference materials and prioritizing them. I mean, we had a lot of conferences about you know, what, what reference material is important or most important or what are the most important properties, but we really didn't bring in, um, I think, sufficient industry and perhaps regulatory agency uh, involvement in the actual process of developing the reference materials. So it might have sped things up a bit. Great. So um, we are out of time. It is 1215. So I want to start by thanking both Wendell and Joanne uh, for sharing your perspectives uh, with our audience today. Really, really excellent discussion. And to our attendees, thank you for being part of today's event. We appreciate your questions. We appreciate your attention. We hope that you also join us for the other webinars in the series. Again, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at NNI Nano News and check out nano.gov for more information. And we thank you for your interest and have a great rest of your day.